Hello and welcome to Model Train Fun. This is the second video in the automation series and we are getting ready to actually look at automation. So the first thing we want to look at is how to detect where my train is. And in order to do that, we are using uh, contact tracks. So in this video, I'm going to show how to take an ordinary C track and turn it into a contact track. Um, you might ask, why don't we just uh, use the uh, Merkling uh, 24995, which is a set of uh, contact tracks? Well, first of all, uh, they are very expensive. Uh, second of all, even if you have those, if you need tracks in between those tracks, you need to do something with those tracks as well, and you cannot buy any tracks like that. So no matter how you twist and turn it, you have to go ahead and turn your C-Track into a contact track. Um, how do you do that? Well, in essence, we basically uh, detect trains by whenever there's a train on the rails, it will short circuit the two rails. So what we just need to make sure of is we disconnect these two rails. The cool thing about Macklin C-Track is it's actually made for this purpose. It's actually made for digital trains and it's made to be easily uh, transformed into uh, Merklin or into contacts uh, tracks. So um, you basically just need to do a, sh a short break of connection on each track. You can do that with any track. You can do it with straight track, you can do it with curved track, you can do it with short track and so on. The only thing you cannot do it with is turnouts and double slips. So basically, you can do it with any straight of any length and any curved track of any length. So, and um, as part of uh, making it into a contact track, we're going to talk just a little more. We're go, uh, going to go into the areas of how do I troubleshoot and what do I need to think about. Because what we really are aiming for with the contact track is for in the automation to be able to detect a consist of trains and the entire consist of trains and actually detect it over a large area. I would actually like to know if my entire block is occupied or not. So this is kind of the first step for that. We'll see in, in later videos how we take this further. So enjoy the video. Let's uh, look at how uh, does the uh, Merklin uh, tracks actually work uh, so we can see how we can turn this into a contact track. So if we look at the uh, Merklin track, uh, basically um, we have uh, each rail is uh, where we connect the brown wire, which is the zero. So we have that for each rail. And then on the uh, center rail, uh, which you see from above as the small pegs in, in the C-track rail, that will be the red, and that's actually the B for barn. So when we have a locomotive uh, on top of that, the uh, way it actually picks up the power is that through the wheels, through the rails, which is the brown, it will actually uh, pick up uh, uh, one phase of, of the uh, electricity, and uh, through the uh, B, which is the red, it will actually pick up the red and then it will use the red and the brown to actually power the locomotive. Now, what does that mean when we turn it into a contact track? Well, in essence, what we do is we disconnect the rails. And you can see here on this drawing, I have to one side, I still have brown connected to the rail, um, but the other side, I have not. So I have basically inside the C track, uh, disconnected these two rails and then I have only powered one of the rails. So what does that mean? Well, that means I got a powered rail and I got a detection rail. So the detection rail is really the one that's not powered and the powered rail is the brown one. So the principle here is I look at the detection rail and then I try and, and figure out when does this become brown uh, which is also the zero. Um, so what happens when a locomotive or a car uh, comes on the rail? Well, basically when a locomotive or a car comes on the rail, the wheels and the axles of the wheels will actually uh, complete a circuit between the two tracks. So as you see here now, the locomotive has been placed on the track, 
which means that the powered rail over here will go through the wheels, through the axles, through the other wheel to the detection rail, and now the detection rail becomes brown. So that means that I can basically put a wire on here and see whenever my detection rail becomes brown, that means the uh, track is occupied, which is in essence what the contract the track does. Now, in the uh, next video, I will show you how to uh, connect the contact track to the S88. So, but in, this, in essence, it, really what the S88 does is it's just a device that's uh, connected to both rails. So it's both connected to the powered rail and the detection rail. And then when the uh, detection track becomes brown, so that's the track over here, uh, then it will say the train is detected or the track is occupied. And do remember the way uh, this happens is it's the wheels of the axle, uh, the wheels and the axle that actually complete the circuit and actually uh, make uh, the other uh, rail brown as well. All right, uh, let's look at uh, how we do this uh, on the C-track. So in essence, we uh, basically need to uh, disconnect the two rails uh, for this uh, track to become a contact track. So this is a standard uh, straight, that's the 24188 uh, straight track I'm looking at. So if uh, we turn it around and look here, then you will see um, here we have the zero, over here we have the B, so this is the brown and this is the red. And if we look closely here, you see here's the tab, just here to the left of the tab, you can see there's a little bridge, okay? That little bridge there is actually the one that connects this rail with this rail. And if we look at it, that was that end we looked at, we can look in the other end as well, and here we see the same thing. You can see we have the, uh, we have the zero here, which is the brown, and we got a little bridge there as well. All right, so what do I do? Well, I take my uh, wire cutting tool or my plier here, and then I basically just sever the bridge. So if we have uh, the bridge here, basically what I do is I put my wire cutting over the bridge here, and then I slide it over towards, towards the tab here, so it basically gets uh, flush with the tab, and then I basically just cut it. Um, and I do that in uh, both ends. So I put it in here, I flush it towards the tab, and then I cut it. If, it, if it's a little too hard, uh, then you've got a hold of the plastic and you don't want to do that. So in essence, now they're severed. Now to make sure, usually what I do is I take a small screwdriver, and then I press on the, the bridge here, so here's the bridge that I severed. So you see it's severed here. And I'm just gonna press on this and then I can bend it down because then I'm sure nothing uh, will catch on it, right? Because you could catch, accidentally still catch the metal here. I do that at both ends. So you see I got one here as well that I severed and I press it down. The good thing also is when you've done this, then you can actually see that it's been pressed down with your naked eye and you can actually see that it has been severed. So you see that here in both ends. All right. Um, the cool thing is that was a straight track. But if you look at every other uh, piece of straight and curved track, it has the same thing. So here we have the, uh, the uh, zero and over here we got the B. So this is the brown and this is the red. Uh, so here at the brown tab, you see there's a bridge, excellent. I also have the same thing in the other end. So over here I got the B, and over here I got the brown. By the way, remember another trick to remember which of these is, is uh, red and brown. The one closest to the edge here is always red. The one furthest from the edge is always the brown, okay? We have to snip the bridge over here at the brown. So I just basically just make it flush with, again, with a tap. I snip it and I press it down here again. All right, I got that one. 
we'll take the other end, go in, we'll snip it, and then I'll press it down. Okay, and you see it's pressed down. Excellent. Um, but that was the standard tracks. You can do the same thing for all the tracks, basically. So the good thing is all the straight tracks and all the curved tracks, you can do this. So this, in essence, means that where I had the um, straight track and the... Oh, let me zoom out a little here. Where you had the uh, straight track and you have the curved track, now I can put them together. And now I got like one long contact track. So that basically means I can make very long contact tracks. And this is um, a huge benefit because one contact track will basically become a block or maybe there needs to be more contact tracks. We'll look at that in a later episode. Okay, so here I have the two uh, tracks I modified before and made into uh, contact tracks by uh, separating uh, the rails or disconnecting the rails. And how did I do that? I snipped the little bridge and then I bend it down. Um, however, now I have these uh, two tracks here, which is uh, the uh, curved and the straight, but I would like them to work as two different contact areas. So I want the curved and the uh, straight to indicate uh, by themselves when there's train on there. So I want to know when a train enters here on the straight, then I want to know it's on the straight, and then when it enters here on the, um, on the, uh, on the curved, I want to know that it's on the curved. So the first thing I have to do is to decide uh, which one is the powered rail and which one is the contact rail. So what I usually try to do is the one closest to me is the powered rail and the one furthest away is the um, uh, contact rail or the detection rail, sorry. Uh, however, that doesn't always work, uh, but you've got to figure out some way uh, to keep track of it, right? So um, I want this track up here to be the de de detection rail. All right, so remember when we turn this around, that's this one up here, right? So if we look here at the end, there is no uh, tabs here on this end here. However, there is on this end here. So I turn it around and this uh, tab here, which is on this side, actually connects to this rail, okay? So you see this tab connects to this rail. And when I turned it around, that's the one furthest away from me. So it's the one furthest away. I turned it around and that becomes this rail over here. And that's the tab for that. If we look at the other end, there's also a tab, right? So remember the tabs that are furthest from the edge is brown. So that's also brown. Uh, so they each their rail. This one here is uh, the rail now that's at the bottom of the picture and when you turn it around it's the one that's at the top of the picture. So the cool thing is the tabs are always closest to the rail uh, that they actually connect to. So since I wanted this one up here as a detection rail and this one as the powered rail that means I really have to uh, connect uh, up. this is my detection rail and this is where I connect my detection. So I take my detection wire and we have that here. And you can see my detection wire is uh, connected to a spade. So what is this? Well, that's actually the uh, 74995 uh, here. So that's these uh, spade connectors I've uh, connected uh, the wire to that goes to the S88. I will cover the S88 in the next uh, episode. For now, I will just con put it on here. So now we have that one here. So that means when we turn it around, the detection wire is on the detection rail, which is the one furthest away from us. Okay. However, I also need to power this rail. How do I do this? So here I have the uh, wires from the central station tree. So I got the red and the brown. How do I connect these? Well, I want this one here to be the powered rail and I look at this end. Ah, it's not this end because that's actually the end where we connect the detection rail. You can see something sticking out. So it must be the other end. So this is the end here 
where I can connect my uh, powered rail and then I might as well connect my rail to this side as well. So I will turn it around and then I will connect my rails here. So I got first the brown one here that I need to connect up here and then I got my red that I need to connect here. All right. Again, remember B is red. Red is the one closest to the edge. Uh, zero is brown and it's the one furthest from the edge and hopefully we got everything correct so when you turn it around well I see I got the wire twisted a little here so when you turn it around this up here furthest away is our detection rail I turn it around indeed that is our detection rail the one closest to me is the powered rail where I want it and if you look at it, that's actually this one here, right? Because now it's on top. Okay. So now we got the, this track here. It's powered and it's ready to detect when trains come on here. I want this one to work as a separate contact area, uh, the uh, curved one. That means I need to make sure, basically, if I put them together like this, remember, the one closest to me is the powered rail. The one furthest away from me is the detection rail. I don't want the detection rail to detect the same thing, but I want the power to go through. So how do I prevent uh, the detection rails here from actually uh, uh, being electrically connected? Well, I do that by using the Maclean 74030. If we look at what is this, this is, well, actually it's hard to see in here. So I have some that are already uh, taken out of the bag. So it's these small things here. These you can actually use to insulate uh, connections from the track. So basically you take one of these here on the side, you see and disconnect it. So you end up with a little thing like this. Okay, let me just try and zoom in a little. So a little thing like this, and you can actually put that on the track. So you see the track here, this is where it connects to the other side. Um, the one closest to the center is the red. The one furthest away from the center is the brown and is the rail. You can also see the rail actually goes over and it's right underneath the rail here. And this one here is closest to the center, which is the red. So we have this little thingy here and you can see there's kind of a hole here in it. And there's a tab. The tab needs to be turned down. So when you put it on, it goes on like this. So it's away from you. And then you basically need to wriggle it on this one here such that it connects. And usually I, if you noticed, I start, let me just try again. I usually start with doing it a little crooked. So it, it goes in here and then it comes on and then you can press it in. So the cool thing about this is now when we connect these track where there's red, there will be no connection. So I will connect these together and you do it gently. Okay. We turn it around and see what do we have on the other side. So what we see here is I got the detection wire to the S88, the gray one here. It's on the detection rail side. If we look at it, it's actually connected here and it bridges to the other track there, but there's no connection because this one is insulated. All right. So that actually means now, let me just zoom out. What we got here is the bottom rail here is powered. So that's the brown. The center rail is powered between the two rails. That's the red. And then we got the detection rail. It's actually insulated here between the rails so it doesn't connect over here. So that means I can connect another con uh, detection wire over here on this detection rail. Okay. We turn it around. It means I want a wire on this one here. Right. Let me try again. So I want it up here on this detection rail where there's something here. So that's this. So that's where I want it. Let me just find another wire. We pull it here magically from my S88. So now I can put that here on my detection tab 
it's here okay and you see it's connected now so now what does that mean okay if we put it down and we look at the wires here let me just arrange it a little so here we can see we got several wires going in we got the power going in from the central station tree we got one detection uh, cable here for the straight rail i got another detection cable for the uh, curved rail so the idea now is that when something is on the straight here then the central station will detect that and when there's something on the curved it will detect that okay so um one thing I forgot to say uh, when I was uh, putting the wires on is please do remember uh, always power off when you are uh, playing with the layout and you are adding wires and so on. And don't forget to uh, read the uh, safety instructions. Um, so um, as you see here, I already uh, have the uh, central station uh, powered on. Uh, currently it's in uh, stop mode. So let me just get it out of stop mode. Um, and then uh, I need to uh, find the uh, contacts so I can see if my uh, contact track works. How do I find those? Well, I pull down in the green menu here at the top. And uh, here I got my accessory list. And then I click uh, my filter. And then I go and find the S88 contacts. And then here you see uh, all the S88 contacts. Um, I uh, only have uh, a few uh, uh, connected and assigned in the central station tree. Uh, a contact that's gray means it's not occupied. A contact that's red means that the um, central station does not know what the state is. And a contact that's yellow means that it's uh, occupied. So if you look uh, here in front of me, I got the same tracks as before, so I got the curved one here, I got a straight. It actually continues on another curved here out of the screen. Um, so here is uh, one contact and here's another contact. So now I would like to test uh, if it actually worked, uh, what I did do. The easiest way to test that is really to uh, take um, a freight car uh, and it needs to be a Märklin. A freight car or one with AC wheels. We'll talk about that uh, in a second. Why is that? So I will take my freight car here and then I will basically uh, put it on the track here and see if something happens. And now you see here on the central station tree, oh, when I get it mounted, you see my contact here, in this case C1, actually uh, turns yellow, uh, which is cool. Um, now this was the straight track, this was the curved. Where does it divide? Let me just try and show it. It's basically there, it divides. So you see the freight car is on the straight track. Now I move it over to the curved as well. And you see something happened with the contact two, so the C2. So basically you see now the, um, the freight car, it's bridging the, the two tracks. So it's both on contact one and contact two. So I will continue driving the freight car and now you see it got off the straight track and now it's only on contact two. Um, now the cool thing is you can decide yourself how long does this area actually needs to be uh, where, you, uh, where you will have the contact. So if I try and shift it a little here, then I can actually add another track here. Okay. Oh, sorry. And if that's also disconnected like the other tracks, it will actually keep on detecting that the freight car is there. So I'll move this one over. So this is the, this is the straight track here. And then here's the curved track. And as you can see, there's another curved track that starts here. Okay. We look at the uh, central station tree. You see it's actually uh, on the C1, so on the straight track. I drive it to the curved track. You see, as soon as it get on the curved track, it will actually uh, turn yellow there. And then it will keep on yellow, even though I continue on this curved track and further out. 
uh, on the other curved track. And that's because I'm using one, I'm basically, I did not isolate between these two, but I isolated over here. So this is one contact and this area over here is another contact. And it's basically all the tracks in between the isolated areas is one contact. So in that way, I can make a really, really long contact. Um, the, um, there's a couple of things you need to think about. So I'll put this into stop mode again. Let me just take the track here. So um, first of all, um, what you must do is actually uh, solder the wire to the spade connector in order to get a good connection. So I suggest you always do that. That would be a good tip because you'll enhance the reliability. Um, if you're using a temporary layout, then use the spade connector here. If you're using a permanent layout, then what I would suggest you do is you solder the wire directly to the tab on the wire here, uh, because that will give a much more reliable uh, connection. So if you have a temporary layout, use the spade connector, uh, but still solder the wire to the spade connector. If you have a permanent layout, then I would solder the wire directly to the, um, to the uh, track. All right, so I have um, made a little loop uh, out of all the tracks. Uh, all the uh, tracks are contact tracks, so I have disconnected uh, the rails. I have um, on the uh, rail closest to uh, the camera here, that is the powered rail. So that is actually the out, outer rail all the way around in the loop. Uh, on the rail furthest away from me uh, over here. That is the uh, detection rail. So that's actually the inner rail all the way around on the loop. Um, so uh, what I have done is you see there is some wires coming in here. They go into the center and then there goes one down to here behind the locomotive. You can see there's one that goes over here and there's one that goes over there and then there's one that goes over here. So I have divided the uh, little loop here into uh, four parts. And you can see I have placed a track here, four places. That's the four places where I have insulated uh, the detection track. So that means, as you can see now here on the uh, central station tree, you can see the locomotive is actually here on the straight here. That straight is uh, C1. So C1 pretty much ends where the locomotive is. It has to go a little further, then it will go into C2. And C1 actually starts all the way up here uh, from that track up here. So that's where it divides. So it goes all the way in here, that's C1. And from uh, this track here, and all the way up to this one, that's C2. And from this one, and all the way over to this one, that's C3. And from this one, and all the way over here is C4. So if we start the uh, locomotive now, and we look at the uh, central station tree, you'll actually see that it will uh, hit each of those as it, as it goes. But let me just start very slowly, and then you will see that it will uh, actually hit the C2 and it will not release the C1 until the train has left the C1. So here you see it, it got to C2 here. Oh, uh, I'm having a bad connection for my locomotive and now it releases C1, it's still on C2. I'll give my locomotive a little more speed here. All right. It's always important to keep your track clean and the wheels clean. And as you see, it goes around now. So now it's on C4 and now it comes to the C1. And then it goes to uh, C2. And then it goes to C3. And then it goes to C4. So as you can see here, um, one of the benefits of the contact track is you can have an entire uh, section of tracks actually detect whether or not it's occupied or not. 
Uh, right now it's just the locomotive drive around, but it will actually also detect the cars. Okay, so um, now we saw the loop working. Uh, now what do we do if things don't work? Um, to me, there's two methods uh, of, of doing it. So uh, if you look at the central station now, uh, all the uh, contacts are free, so they are not uh, yellow, they are gray, so they are not occupied. If we look at the track here in front of us, I got a contact section one that goes here till this track. Then I got a contact section two that goes till this one here, this track here, and then I got a contact uh, track three here. So of course, one way of testing is uh, to take uh, a freight car with AC wheels. You put it on, and then you see that. Oh, then you see it becomes yellow. So in this case, C1. When you drive it over, you can see that C2 becomes. Uh, yellow and then you can see uh, C3 becomes yellow here at the end. Okay, um, so in this fashion, for example, if I put it down on C1 and C2 also lit up, that meant I would have forgotten the insulator, for example. So that's one way I can test it. Basically just using my central station uh, and uh, driving a, a car or the track. However, it's not always enough. So another thing you can do is you can use a multimeter. So a digital uh, multimeter, you need one that can actually detect uh, short circuits. Uh, so in this case, I got here a little option down here. You can see there's something with a sound. So if I turn it over here on, in this mode here, that's a continuity tester. So you need a digital multimeter with a continuity tester continuity tester. So here I got the two ends and basically what you can see is if I put that out here, when I touch these two, you see it turns, it, it both gives me a visual indication with red up here, but it also gives me a beep, right? So what I can do with these ones is I can test the track. So remember that the track closest to me is the power track and the track uh, rail, sorry, the rail closest to me is the power rail and the way rail furthest away from me is the detection rail. So if I put these two on the power rail here, then you can hear there's a connection and I should get that even when I do it uh, far away. So I, I need a connection all the way through. That means the power flows away, flows through all of them. And then I need to make sure if I have my uh, C2 here, if I look between the two rails, there should be no contact. So, or there should be uh, no uh, short circuit. So you can hear there's no beep. There's beep here on the power rail. That's not on the detection rail. So that's a good thing. Uh, the other thing I can do is I can put it here on the detection rail, and then I can test with the detection rail next to it. So here is C3 out here. You hear there's no connection. I can also charge C1, which is over here. Let me just do it like this so I can charge C1 and there's no connection. So basically you can use your digital voltmeter uh, multimeter to uh, detect whether or not the powered rail is powered for all the uh, contact sections. And then you can go in on each contact section and then you can take from the, um, uh, from the uh, detection rail and see if it connects to anything else. It's not allowed to connect to the uh, power rail and it's not allowed to connect to the sections next to it. So uh, what uh, could be wrong if I detected uh, there was a connection somewhere? Well, uh, first of all, the uh, most common thing I usually do is I uh, connect the uh, detection wire to the wrong side of uh, the track. So in this case here, if I'm looking here at the top, I see the track from above. My detection rail is the one furthest away and the one closest to me is the power rail. That actually means when I turn it around and you can see here I have turned it around, then it's actually in, uh, in this end here to the, uh, to the uh, left. Uh, I have connected the wire to in this case. 
uh, which is uh, the one that sticks out here. So when I turn it around, that is actually the power rail. So I should have connected it to the other end. So this is uh, typically uh, the most common mistake I make. I basically connect the uh, detection wire to the power rail instead of the detection rail. And what happens then if the detection wire is connected to the power rail, it just always shows occupied. Uh, the other thing uh, that often can go wrong is that if you look at the wire itself and the spade uh, connector here and the connection to the track, if there's a bad connection, uh, if you haven't soldered it, there's even bigger chance for a bad connection. So solder the wire to the spade connector uh, on a temporary layout and then make sure that it connects securely to the track. On a permanent layout, I would advise you to just uh, directly solder the wire to the spade connector. So do uh, make sure you've got a reliable connection and I highly encourage you uh, to solder the connection. Um, another thing that can go wrong is that uh, maybe uh, when you uh, disconnected the rail, so if you look down here at the green, so here to the track to the uh, left, you can see here I actually bent down the bridge and this one is disconnected. If you look over here in the red, the bridge is over here on the other side and you can actually see that has not been disconnected. So that's another common mistake I, I often do. Uh, together with uh, choosing uh, the uh, power rail instead of the detection rail, which was the first up here, I would say the second most common I do is I had forgotten to snip the rails or I didn't do it proper and I didn't bend it down proper. So maybe there's still something touching something. So you may have to go back and double check that. And remember, you have to check it on all tracks within the contact section. Um, so yes, the fix is cut the connection. Uh, the other thing that might not be as obvious, if you look at the, the C tracks and here's a close up of it here, the rails are actually not touching each other from uh, track to track. However, if the rail is not put on precisely on there, then you have some tracks that can accidentally actually touch each other. So it could be that uh, if you uh, look up closely, there's no uh, gap in between the tracks. So the C track is actually made and prepared uh, to be contact tracks and made and prepared uh, to, uh, to uh, support digital. So this gap is natural. Uh, however, there can be cases where you can't find it. How do you fix that? Well, typically what I do is grab another track. So if there's uh, two tracks that um, fit too closely together and the, you've got touching rails, well, why not just use them in a section where it could actually benefit you that they touch? So basically within the same contact area. Uh, the other thing is you can make them not touch each other if you don't have any other track. You can either gently apply a screwdriver in between here. Uh, be careful, you might break your screwdriver. You can gently try and push a rail or uh, you could actually try and shorten the rail a little. However, I would highly encourage you to grab another rail. So uh, one of the benefits of the contact track is that the entire consist actually uh, triggers the uh, contact area. So if you look at the schematics I have here, that's a schematics uh, of the uh, C track. Uh, so what you have here, the dotted line here in the center, so that's actually uh, the red uh, or the B for barn. And then I got the two rails here. I got the black rail here, which is the uh, 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 detection rail. Uh, and is it not powered, but it's divided into three sections here. And then at the bottom, I got the uh, brown rail, uh, which is the uh, powered rail. So what happens? Well. As soon as you put a train on the track, actually what it will do is it will bridge the powered rail with the detection rail. So you see here the detection rail because becomes brown as well. Now, if I um, move the train forward, then as soon as the first wheel hits uh, the, uh, the second uh, contact area here, it will actually uh, detect that it has arrived. 
Um, and that will continue when the train drives in. Uh, it will also it will continuously uh, detect that it's in the area all the way uh, till uh, the last wheel. Uh, as long as the last wheel is still in the contact area, it will still detect it's there until basically uh, the uh, the consist has left the uh, the contact area. So the benefit here is that from the first wheel to the last wheel we get a continuous contact. Uh, that also means if, for example, uh, that by accident my, uh, my train was longer than I thought it would be and it's sticking in into the previous contact area, it would actually know this. If I drop a freight car or anything like that, it would know this. So that's one of the benefits of the contact areas. However, there are also some things uh, you have to consider because the first wheel and the last wheel that actually causes, uh, can cause a problem. So if you got dirty wheels or you got dirty track, then when you only got one wheel on there and if it's dirty, there's a bigger chance that it might actually uh, uh, trigger twice on the wheel. So think of it this way, if there's a dirty spot on the wheel, as soon as that dirty spot hits, it will actually disconnect. So let's assume this first wheel up here is dirty, it rolls down, and now the dirt touches. That means that it will not lead the power across here uh, from the power rail to the detection rail, and then it will actually look like it's um, free for a very short while, and then it will be occupied again when the wheel turns further around. The same thing with the last wheel. So this is uh, one of the things you have to consider when you're doing uh, the contact tracks. There's also other things that can be less obvious. Um, oh yeah, so how do you actually uh, fix this? Well, to me, the best advice is clean the wheels and clean the tracks, make sure it's clean all the time. By the way, is that really a big bother? No, not really, because you would like it to be clean anyways to make sure that you get good contact such that whenever you are doing automation, your control station always can tell uh, the locomotive uh, what it needs to do. Um, I have heard uh, some people uh, uh, post, uh, post a trick uh, that actually uh, is about changing the S88 sensitivity. I never tried this and I'm not sure it really works. Um, the other thing you have to think about is if you got a long car or a locomotive, so you see here on my drawing here to the um, uh, to the uh, right, I got here a very long car. Let's assume this is a passenger car with bogies on each end. Now I made my contact track so short that actually the uh, car can span across uh, the uh, contact track. So if I do this, there will be a gap. So that means as soon as the bogey pass, the first bogey passes this you'll get into a situation like this where it's not detected as being there and then the train will keep on driving and then the second bogey will hit this uh, contact area. So if you've got a very long car and locomotive, then this could uh, happen. So how do I avoid this? Well, basically don't make uh, short contact sections. Uh, when we get further into the automation, you'll also see there's many other benefits by making uh, long contact sections. So this will uh, typically not happen. Uh, I'm just telling you this just to be sure that you're aware of it, that don't make short contact sections, always make them long. And I would say make them at least as long at the, as the longest car you have. Uh, the other thing that could happen is um, if you got a consist and you see it here to the right, I got a consist of uh, freight cars, for example. The first one has AC wheels, the next one has non-mackling or DC wheels, and the last one has uh, AC wheels. So if we um, have a, a standard mackling car, what it does is it will actually let the, lead the power from the uh, power rail to the detection rail. However, if you're using two rail systems, so non-mackling systems, you do not want 
to actually short circuit the two rails because the two rails are actually two different kinds of powers. It's basically, uh, well, in quotes, plus and minus or black and red. Um, it's only really a unique item of the Matlin tracks that they're both brown. And that's because we got the center rail, which is the red one. So in this case where you see here, I have a short uh, contact track again. When my consist comes along, there's one uh, uh, freight car in here that has non-mattling wheels. It actually means it will not short it. So how can I fix that? Well, first of all, what I would uh, advise you to do is uh, place these in the middle because then you would still get the first wheel and last wheel detection, uh, such that we detect the entire uh, consist. Um, and then if you avoid short sections, uh, then, uh, then it's not a problem because there would typically always be some other AC cars in there as well. However, if it's all DC or non matlin what I would advise you to do is uh, replace the wheels uh, with AC wheels. Um, there's also the possibility of altering DC wheels such that they will actually short the track as well. All right. That was actually a pretty long video about a simple thing. So the only thing we have to do in order to make a standard uh, C track either straight or curved of any length is actually uh, to cut uh, the bridge uh, on the track underneath in both ends, right? Remember, it has to be both ends. Um, so to me, um, this is not uh, damaging uh, the track. I haven't seen any issues with the track uh, after I've done this, even though I'm not using uh, them for contact tracks. So uh, to me, uh, I don't see any problem with doing that because I've had some people asking me, don't you damage the track? No, you do not. Um, so the other thing is, um, what's the advantage uh, of the contact track? Well, first of all, it is actually uh, pretty reliable uh, when you get it going. Uh, you need to make sure though that the wheels are clean uh, and the track is clean uh, in order to make sure you uh, got good contact. Uh, but you want that anyways when you're doing automation because when you're doing automation it's very important that every single command goes to the locomotive, every single command goes to the, uh, to the turnouts and so on. So you need uh, to be uh, focusing on reliability and focusing on that it's clean. I like that the uh, contact track actually uh, can be an entire contact area and it can actually uh, uh, keep track of the entire consist. So I actually know if my entire length of track, if it's unoccupied, the train is actually away from the track. There's nothing left behind. There's not a freight car that was accidentally dropped. It's not accidentally sticking into the previous track and, and so on. If you look at other methods like the uh, circuit track or the read switch, they are actually points. Uh, so you just know when a certain point uh, of the train has passed another certain point, right? So for circuit tracks, it actually detects when the slider passes. Uh, for read switches, it actually detects when a little magnet you put on the train uh, passes uh, the read switch. Um, the uh, advantage with the contact track is it doesn't care which direction you drive. It's direction independent. You don't need to have a slider in both ends or a magnet in both ends or anything like that. So, so it actually becomes uh, much easier uh, to do. Um, the other thing is, as I can take any track and make into a contact track, uh, that means that I have a great deal of flexibility on my layout. Now do remember when I say any track, it's any straight and any curved, not the other tracks. So not the uncoupler track, not the turnout track, not the double slip and so on, right? Uh, however, that also matches what you do in, in the real life when you're defining blocks. So to me, it kind of adds up. That's why I like the contact tracks and I can create contact areas, which in essence we'll see in some of the future videos will become the contact blocks. So, but like any, uh, any uh, sensor, 
method, there's also disadvantages. So to me, uh, the, the biggest one is that uh, it needs uh, AC wheels because it basically needs to short circuit the two rails. So if you go and buy uh, freight cars from other manufacturers, then uh, you would have to replace them with AC wheels. Or maybe you only care about the locomotive, but then you don't get the benefit of tracking the entire consist. But again, it depends on your method of uh, automation. So to me, that's the biggest disadvantage uh, with the contact track. So if you have any uh, tips or tricks, uh, please leave it in the comments uh, below. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up and hit the uh, like button. And please do uh, subscribe to the channel. And I hope to see you again in the next video. Enjoy.